sorry, this is, oh. Yeah, hi. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. This is Jan Manwright and Joel Nowak from um, Cancer ABCs. And we're thrilled to have our friend and our expert today, Dr. Ellie Van Allen from Dana-Farber and the Broad Institute. And he's going to talk about genetics in advanced prostate cancer. And we'll give you a definition of advanced prostate cancer into the talk. Um, I want to take just a minute and talk about how we try to do our webinars and how we do them. And um, one thing I want to be clear about is we cannot give you medical advice. Joel and I cannot do that because we're not medical professionals, but even physicians um, won't do it from a podium or a webinar. They'll do it in clinics. So we just need to make sure that you understand that. However, we are definitely going to help you. There's truly so much we can do just short of medical advice. We can help you understand your own situation and your own cancer better, which is actually what genetics is about. Uh, we can help you understand risks and benefits of tests and treatment. Um, every treatment decision and even test decision is risk versus benefit. Um, we can help you clear, clearly develop better questions for your doctor. Better questions will always get you better answers. That's my tagline to my 13 year um, story with my husband. Um, all of this will help you do shared decision making at a higher level. Shared decision making is a simple term that means the patient shares a decision with the doctor and the doctor shares the decision with the patient. I want you to write down that phrase if you don't have it because it's actually, uh, I would call it a medical term. It's actually in the guidelines for prostate cancer, newly diagnosed, um, that are validated by all the urologists, radiation oncologists, and medical oncologists. So shared decision making is a term that can really work for you in a doctor's appointment if you're trying to um, start a conversation, get the doctor to listen to you, let's say, um, because we all know it can be hard. Sometimes you're pressed for time. But still, the most important thing in that appointment is always the patient, always the patient. I want to thank our sponsors today, Janssen Oncology. Um, they are the makers of the drug Erlita. For more information, go to Erlita.com. Dendrian is the, the maker of Proven. Go to Proven.com for more information. Um, Bayer is the maker of Zofigo and Nubeca. Go to Zofigo.com or Nubeca.com. Um, hold on, I've got to mute somebody. Caller number three, I think you need to mute yourself. Um, and Estella's Pfizer are, are the makers of Extandi. For more information on that, you can go to Extandi.com. Or any of these, you can also go to our website, which is CancerABCs.com. I also want to thank Foundation Medicine, who is a sponsor. They are the makers of the one test that is FDA approved for the next generation tissue somatic testing that we're going to talk about today for advanced prostate cancer. Exact Sciences, which is the maker of the ARV7 test. Blue Earth, who is the maker of the Aximan PET scan. So, um, and then we have My Event and Progenics. So if I'm talking about sponsors, I like to talk about why they're on. I think that's really helpful to patients. So that being said, I'm excited to turn this over to Ellie, Dr. Van Allen, and to Joel Nowak. Hi, Ellie. Uh, Dr. Van Allen uh, is agreed to join us for this seminar. He is the world's uh, foremost expert on uh, advanced prostate cancer and genetics. We are really lucky to have him. I, I appreciate your taking the time. Uh, he also sees patients at Dana-Farber Hospital in Boston. Uh, and I know there's a huge strain now uh, seeing patients uh, given the virus. So again, a really big thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm actually going to, at this point, uh, ask if Dr. Uh, Van Allen, if, if he would be willing to go through his slides you know, uh, and take it from there. And, and if it's okay with you, I, I might interrupt you occasionally during it to ask some questions. Um, Jan did not mention that if you have a question, there is a, you didn't mention that, did you, Jan? I mentioned the chat box, yeah. You did? Oh, okay, never mind. And just just Sorry. one quick correction. Uh, cancer ABC's webpage is cancerabcs.org, not .com. But with that, uh, Dr. Van Allen. 
great. So thank you, Joel. Thank you, Jan. Thanks to your organization for all you do. Um, the first thing I'll just do is the mic check, make sure you can actually hear me. We, we got a thumbs up from yes. Joel. Great. Um, second thing is, is Jan, you said you're going to put my slides in presentation mode and advance for me. Is that right? Yes. If it's okay, I might keep them in this mode because then um, I, would you rather have them in presentation mode? Yeah, it's not fine too. It's whatever, whatever you prefer. Um, uh, it's fine with me. Because I'm um, making back and forth. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. Um, so uh, again, it's a privilege to virtually be here. Um, this isn't quite as as wonderful a locale as the last time I did one of these in, in a very lovely spot in Florida. Um, I'm in the, calling to you from the back of my condo in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Um, as you heard, again, I'm, my name is Ellie Van Allen. I'm a medical oncologist at Dana-Farber with a focus in prostate cancer. And I run a, a large research lab focused on studying the genetics of advanced prostate cancer all with the hopes of trying to use a lot of data because we're actually a computer science lab uh, to find new cures for this disease. Um, feel free to follow along with me in the future. Uh, you know, the one, one corner is our lab's website. The other corner is my Twitter handle um, in case anyone wants to hear me um, uh, on social media. So next slide. Um, so first here are my disclosures. And we're always like advised to disclose anything anytime we've ever gotten anywhere near a company. Um, so here are mine. Uh, I'll just pause for a second. Um, and then actually go to the next slide. Probably the most important disclosure is, um, you know, uh, I, I realize these are extraordinary times that we're in. Um, and thank you all for joining this call because it's still important to think about yourselves and your loved ones in spite of and, and because of everything that's happening. And I just, you know, I think I'm taking a cue from one of my colleagues who, who's doing this is sort of I just acknowledge how hard it is. Um, this is a picture of me and my, this is rather, not me, this is a picture of my two kids. Uh, my son's uh, five-year-old birthday party was held in our quarantine um, after we had to cancel his birthday party uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, the, even that, as the, sort of the smallest little thing, was, was just, you know, just sort of yet another sort of thing that's just hard. And so I just hope for everyone on this call, no matter how this is affecting you, and I'm, I'm certain it is in some way, shape, or form, that you, your family, your friends, and all loved ones are, are, are sort of safe and sound. And that we all together get through this and could get back to sort of um, you know, regular life. So with that, um, so briefly an outline of what I'm gonna talk about. I'll give a little bit of background on some of, of, uh, of the basic science behind why we do genetics. Uh, talk about tumor genetics and testing in that context. Talk about inherited genetics, the genetics you were born with. And then talking more generally about how you actually are, are in the driver's seat to help us as an entire community make new discoveries for prostate cancer. And I'll, I'll say at, at the tail end, I will have sort of one extra slide on sort of like prostate cancer and coronavirus. Um, so you go to the next slide. So first, just a little bit of background. Um, why are we doing all of this and why does this matter for advanced prostate cancer? So um, if you go to the next slide, um, this is actually a graphical representation of what we're really trying to accomplish. Because what we're really trying to do is achieve sort of this vision of precision cancer medicine. And this is, you know, starting to be what we do in real life, but in reality, it is still not um, the most common way we take care of, of really any cancer, but especially advanced prostate cancer. But let me walk you through this graphic just so you understand. Uh, what we're aiming for, what we're trying to do. The vision is that a patient comes and sees, let's say me at Dana-Farber or wherever you are in the clinic, we obtain a fresh biopsy of the tumor sample from the patient at, in real time. We do very you know, sophisticated genetic testing of the tumor and we do genetic testing of the genes the patient was born with. We apply lots of complicated you know, computer science technology to these data to make to figure out basically the needle in the haystack, what's actually driving this disease. Uh, we make a decision based off of that information. We hope that this works. And if and when it stops working, we basically repeat that process over again. We get another biopsy. We look for what changed uh, and we then drug that. And we, through this vision, turn a disease that is, you know, you know, typically becomes a re treatment resistant and lethal into something that can be managed in a chronic way, just like we manage a lot of diseases in medicine, blood pressure, diabetes, and so on. Um, that's what we're really trying to do. And that's why the genetics really matters. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, 
uh, what I want to also emphasize is that there's a lot of really confusing jargon associated with uh, genetic testing in the clinic. And I will, what I'll try to emphasize, and I'll hopefully try to repeat over the course of this talk, is the two main distinctions. But first, um, genetic testing as a whole has, its, has a bunch of other names as well. So sometimes people will call it next generation sequencing, or they'll just say NGS. Um, all of those are basically synonyms for some kind of genetic testing. There's probably some other uh, emerging lingo as well, but just to sort of think about what the most common uh, words are. And then once you sort of have that down, there's two very distinct kinds of genetic testing. One is tumor testing. So basically the genetic code of the tumor. Sometimes that's called somatic testing. Um, this represents changes in your DNA after you are born. And this is specifically the genetics of the tumor, which is distinct from and has changed because that's why it is now a tumor. It has changed from the genetics you were born with. Um, there are a lot of different flavors of tumor testing or somatic testing. It could be whole genome sequencing, which is literally every single bit, every single part of the genetic code, all three billion base pairs. It could be whole exome sequencing. That's the portion of the genetic code that turns into other things in your body. That's about 1% of the whole genome. Or it could be what most commonly is used in the clinic, something called panel sequencing, where we actually zoom in on typically anywhere from 300 to 500 genes in cancer. There are in to out of 20,000 total, and we look specifically in those genes. All of those are different kinds of tests, but what they're all trying to look at is what is the genetic code of the tumor, and what in that tumor in the genetic code has changed that might actually be druggable. And that is distinct from germline or inherited genetic testing. That is the genetic code you were born with. It's typically done not through a biopsy of your tumor, but rather through saliva or blood testing. Um, and that gives us information about the genetics you were born with, which itself may be relevant for how we treat you, which we'll come back to a little bit later. So just again, to emphasize there are two types of genetic testing, tumor testing and germline or inherited testing. So if you go to the next slide, um, we care about doing this because metastatic prostate cancer is you know, very complicated genetically and um, it is also complicated clinically. And there's a lot, in fact, it's so complicated that oftentimes there's a lot of different definitions on what we actually think this means. But just to keep it as clear as we can for this audience, for this talk, metastatic prostate cancer is prostate cancer that has spread beyond the tissues of the prostate itself. It could be pelvic lymph nodes, so lymph nodes in your pelvis, sometimes that's called M0. It could be lymph nodes in other parts of your body. It could be soft tissue like liver, or it could be in your bone. Sometimes those things are called M1. Um, there are many men suffering with metastatic prostate cancer in just the US alone, 150,000 approximately. And unfortunately, 30,000 men were gonna die every year of this disease. Um, there are treatments and the treatment landscape is changing so rapidly, it even changed yesterday. We'll come back to that slide in a bit. Um, but there is still, for most men, no cure. And that comes back to that principle of precision cancer medicine, where we try, we're trying in real time to turn to steer this ship from being a lethal disease to being a manageable chronic disease. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so what is the difference between advanced and metastatic? Um, uh, it's a little bit of a complicated lingo. Um, there's a reason we actually care about this distinction because the Medicare def definition uh, is that is recurrent, metastatic, relapse, refractory, or stage three or four. And stage three oftentimes is not actually technically metastatic, meaning it does not spread to other parts of the body. But this matters for a reason we're going to come to in a moment. Um, and it is worth noting that private insurances that are not Medicare may have different definitions of what that means. So why am I telling you this? If you go to the next slide, um, it matters because um, 
as of about now, gosh, it's been a couple of years now, a lot of time flies. Um, access to tumor testing is very much linked, tumor genetic testing that is, is very much linked to that definition. Because as of this statement in March of 2018, Medicare will actually reimburse, so they will pay for next generation sequencing, or NGS, or tumor genetics. So again, all of those same words I was using before, it's that test. In any patient who has, and I've sort of underlined all the relevant um, definitions here, recurrent, relapsed, refractory, metastatic, or advanced stage three or four cancer, including, of course, prostate cancer. And I say that because you may not realize that you are eligible for genetic tumor genetic testing, um, or that, or that it may, you may think it's just something unattainable to you from a cost perspective. But this is something you should bring up with your doctor and say, you know, if you, for instance, if you're Medicare, you know, gosh, does it make sense for me to get this testing done? Because it, as of March 2018, I will be reimbursed for this. So let me stop there because the next slide is, a, I think, a question slide um, and see what questions people have. Um, uh, I actually, it looks like maybe most importantly, somebody's put in the chat box so they can't see the slideshow. Um, yeah, I suppose... so um, I honestly don't know the answer. If you're on your computer, there's probably something you need to click. Um, and if not, this will be recorded and you can watch the video later. Um, so, the, 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 Jan, did you get a chat box question? If not, I'll ask one. The chat box question is from one person who cannot see the slideshow. So oh, I see. I'm, okay. everybody else can, I think. So I'm sorry. I wish okay. I. You okay. Know, so, I, uh, uh, Ellie, I mean, you mentioned that uh, Medicare will only pay for uh, sequencing, uh, tumor sequencing one time. And of course, we know that prostate cancer is a cancer that that's constantly mutating. It, the tumors are changing. And if I, if I am correct, you can take a piece of tissue from one part of a tumor and do uh, and look at the genetics and take a piece from another part of the tumor and there may be differences between them. Uh, is that correct? So yeah, that's a good question. And so what you're getting at is a complex and emerging scientific problem. It's something we actually study in the lab. It's called tumor heterogeneity, um, uh, meaning the genetics of a tumor can change in space and time. So in one, if we took out a prostate tumor from the gland and we sampled the genetics in two different regions, it is not going to be the case that they have the identical genetic code. The genetic code in one side might be different than the genetic code in the other. And similarly, if, you, if we take a tumor sample at one time point, we wait a year and we take that same tumor sample a year later after some treatment, it also will not be the same because these tumors are constantly evolving. Um, however, we still feel like it's most, at least for now, the, our, with our current understanding is that um, most, the vast majority of relevant, clinically actionable changes in the genetic code in tumor next generation sequencing tests um, are what we call clonal, which means they've been there for a long time. They've probably been there since the beginning or they've emerged early on in the metastatic setting. And we also recognize that most men may not have an opportunity to get another biopsy, especially if they don't have what's called biopsyable tumors, meaning tumors that we can easily stick a needle into safely. Um, and so we tend to be, you know, we're okay at the, for the time being of getting a snapshot, which, you know, may not be useful in the moment anyways, but um, uh, is still going to be useful in general. So if, if I'm understanding what you're saying, uh, we should consider uh, having our uh, somatic or uh, our tumor genetics done as soon as we have uh, some tissue that's biops that can be biopsied. Is that would that be a reasonable well, assumption? I think it's reasonable to at least bring it up with your oncologist at that time because if no other reason, it doesn't. It's not a test that turns around in, in, in an hour or a day. It can take a few weeks. It can take months. Um, and so. Um, uh, you know, it's the kind of, you know, you may not need it in the moment, but it's probably something you should bring up with your doctor if you're going to have those, that kind of a biopsy uh, at around the time of the biopsy. I think. Terrific. Okay. Any I think there's questions? a question there, Jan. Um, no, we're good. Okay. Um, 
I also wanted to point out for anyone who's confused about what germline and somatic is, I mean, uh, at least dis dis discussing the somatic of the tumor, but there's actually uh, on our YouTube page, um, a webinar which we did and which we recorded uh, with a genetics counselor who she, and she talks very specifically about germline. So if you're confused or you want a refresher, you can go back and, and look at that again. And also becoming both, I'm mean, going to sort of actually, it's a good segue into the next part of the talk, but also preview the part after that. So I'm going to talk in more detail about tumor genetic testing, but I'm also going to come back to inherited or germline genetic testing as well. Um, so, uh, so let's actually go in a little bit more detail into tumor genetic testing for advanced prostate cancer. Um, all right, before, let's see. Um, Oh, yes. Thank you, Rick. Yes. So he's saying, Rick is saying in the chat box, be careful. You get once, you get one time tests. So be aware when you use it. Uh, I do agree that it would be great to get, you know, for, for the guidelines to change for reimbursement. To, to, it is still true that there might be utility of getting it more than once, uh, especially once the, the uh, more sophisticated versions of the tests come online. But um, I think the flip side to that is, is we've, I, I've been more, what's more common I've seen is people don't get it when they can. And then when they actually probably could use that information, it takes too long to get the results back because then they're starting late. But it is it is a good point. So it's something to bring up with your, with your it should be a discussion with you and your oncologist at the end. Right, right. we actually have a, a question here for people to ask their medical oncologist. So um, yeah, because Medicare, my understand does pay once. So that makes it a tricky right. decision. Um, and I understand that sometimes you can submit for somatic tumor testing and you could have insufficient tissue, which you yep. usually know within two days and you may have to call your doctor to make sure you had enough. So there's a little bit of navigating that can sometimes be helpful. Right. So let's talk a little bit more about the tumor genetic testing. So if you go to the next slide, um, so this is a slide I borrow from my friends at the Prostate Cancer Foundation. And it's, it's very interesting because it, the details of of the actual drugs and the and the things on this are are not as relevant as the sheer number of them that are on this slide. And I, I mean, what I, I mean to say is that you know the the science is moving so quickly in this disease, and the number of drug targets and drugs in development is vast. And a lot of them are linked to tumor genetics um, from a lot of the work that myself and others have done over the last decade of science has actually made this field one that we actually feel like can become a precision cancer medicine field. And, the, and each one of these targets is currently in development and in various stages of clinical trials. And all, most of them are related to um, uh, specific genetic lesions in the tumor. I say that, and that that is all true. However, sometimes it sort of lacks sort of the home run kind of aspirations that we're trying to get at that that a that a sort of a personal story can actually change and so it can, can actually more effectively sh uh, guide rather so if you go to the next slide um you know we have a, a w one use one case study it was actually from a a patient who i had the privilege of meeting um at, at one at a prior cancer abc's uh Manorite, uh conference in florida it was a metastatic prostate cancer patient um who had progressed on four different types of therapies and was approaching hospice, did the tumor next generation sequencing test, or NGS, or somatic, and had a mutation in a gene called MSH2. So uh, one mutation in one gene out of 20,000 genes in the genome. Um, and that mutation was directly linked to a specific change in the tumor that made this patient so a good candidate for a drug called Dervalumab. Uh, it's, it's a part of a class of immune checkpoint blockade therapies. The patient ended up on a clinical trial as a result of that mutation, and the patient had, had a four-year complete response uh, to this drug. And I say that because that's, while still, you know, frankly, not going to be the norm for most people, and it is still aspirational, um, but this is what we're trying to get towards, and this is why this really matters, and having these data could actually be uh, impactful um, for men with advanced prostate cancer. 
Um, let's go to the, oh, let's go ahead. Yeah, Ellie, I, I'll give an update on this patient. Mm -hmm. I emailed with him um, before the webinar to see if he wanted to come and he's, he's busy with family, but he's now five cool. years, no evidence of disease. That's so wonderful. yeah. So even though this MSH, and that's an abbreviation for MS high, correct? That it's a gene that when mutated can create MSI tumors. Okay. Yes. Yeah, because we hear the words MS high sometimes. Yeah. Although rare in his case was a no evidence of disease, dramatic response. Um, he was truly entering hospice before he started this disease. So rare, but ex but uh, dramatic response. And if you go to the next slide, um, you know, so a little bit, so this is actually, just, and so Jane, you beat me to it, um, but this is exactly the point we're trying to make. So what is this mutation in this gene? It's, it's a, it creates something called microsatellite instability, otherwise called MSI high or MMRD. Again, you know, in medicine, we're very good about coming up with jargon and, and, and like acronyms for things, um, but it all means the same thing. It's this very specific kind of tumor driven by a very specific genetic change. Um, it's not that common in prostate cancer, but there's an FDA approved therapy directly linked to this event called pembrolizumab or Keytruda, um, that again, one will, could perhaps only realize they're eligible for if they have the tumor genetic testing. That's not the only example like this, um, but it just sort of emphasizes how this could be useful in a clinical, in clinical care for advanced prostate cancer. So let me stop there and see if there's any questions. I think the next slide is a question slide. Um, let's see, something in the chat box. Ah, thanks, Rick. Um, any questions? I'll just say what Rick, Rick said, but I think this is important. Um, whenever patients get tests, there's always a time to wait for the result, right? And you had, Dr. Van Allen had just mentioned that um, uh, sometimes if patients wait till they're in a really bad place in their disease, it can be difficult because they're waiting too long to get their test results back. So timing can, can matter. But one of the first steps with um, this somatic testing is to make sure that there was sufficient tissue, quote unquote. And um, if there is insufficient tissue, one of the companies, which is Foundation Medicine, does not charge you, according to Rick. I, this is another advocate, well known. So, but I think what we learned, we were at a seminar up there uh, six months ago or so, is that you can call, if, if you were to have this testing and your doctor ordered it, you can call the doctor in probably probably 48 hours and ask if you had enough tissue. Did, it, did the test go through? Did I have insufficient tissue or not? I will mention there's another company called CARIS, C-A-R-I-S, and they do the same testing, and I don't think they have as much trouble with the insufficient tissue um, problem. So those are things that people can look up for themselves and ask their doctors. Ellie, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think there's there's a few vendors that are that are, that exist now, and in some cases, depending on where your your care is, is and how, you know, one or more may be available to you. Um, it's you know, it used to be more confusing, although I think at this at this juncture, unlike perhaps one to two, three years ago, many oncologists have gotten quite accustomed to, to sort of navigating this. Um, okay. because, and, and I'd say that, again, I, I would have that conversation with your oncologist, they may, because they may have a streamlined way of facilitating it at your clinic with your pathology lab or whatever the case may be. Right, but ask so, the um, question because sometimes yeah. you don't get the answer unless you ask, so. Right. I also want to point out that uh, even though this is this this webinar is not about clinical trials, here's a really good example of when a clinical trial actually allowed this particular individual that Ellie shared uh, to receive an advanced treatment, um, which wouldn't be available, could or possibly wouldn't be available for many years after before you know until after the trial was completed. So I think that we should think of trials. Uh, as an opportunity in many cases uh, to actually be an opportunity to get an, an advanced treatment. I think that's an alternative way that, that we can view trials. Or to look so, and see if they're offering somatic testing in that trial, because that could be of interest. And so uh, I agree with that. And I think, uh, I, you know, we can't, I mean, it's also very timely given what's happening in the real world right now, that, you know, the clinical trials are why they're so necessary to actually sort of separate noise from signal um but I, and you know 
there, there are a lot of benefits to doing this, even though it might be intimidating. Again, something to talk about your oncologist. Um, you know, I'll just sort of uh, answer a question um, for me that so sort of about urologists. So urologists typically will not do these, not be the ones facilitating these kinds of genetic tests. Um, or, you know, it, it should be done, frankly, with the medical oncologist, in my opinion, although they the urologist will often do earlier types of genetic testing for not advanced prostate cancer, which is a different topic. Um, and I should also add, in terms of the question about, you know, um, what if, let's say you don't, if you're looking at this slide deck, you're like, well, I don't, what if I don't have MSH2? Um, uh, I would emphasize the, the earlier slide that had the table of all the different targets. And I think the, uh, the opportunities to drug all sorts of different types of genetic lesions is increasingly at play and is constantly evolving. And the, and the more we learn, the more data we get from men with advanced prostate cancer and learn from them directly, the longer this list is getting. And, the, and I sort of have the privilege in my relatively young career of seeing this, this list. I've seen this table from PCF you know, many times now, um, but every year it gets longer and longer. Um, this one is probably not even the most recent one. It probably is even bigger. I couldn't even fit it on one slide anymore. And that's, I think, what's so exciting about this. So all of that was tumor testing. Um, and um, again, that's the genetics of the tumor that has changed from the genetics that you were born with. So why do we also care about the genetics you were born with or the inherited genetic testing? So we go to the next slide. Um, well, it matters for uh, a few reasons. Um, so here's just uh, why it matters outside of prostate cancer. So this was a very famous um, uh, opinion piece in the New York Times by Angelina Jolie, the actress, um, who was found to be a carrier or had a mutation in a, in a gene in her inherited or germline genome called BRCA1 um, that predisposed her to a higher risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer and led to her implementing some preventative measures that she otherwise would not have done that can also impact not just you but also your family through something called cascade testing and it may invoke, you know, some things that you may be able to help your kids or your grandkids prevent cancers, depending on what happens. But even more than that, if, if all of those things are scary or intimidating, or and I, we completely understand, it is really worth emphasizing that it is not just the tumor genetics that matter for treatment decision making. It is increasingly the germline genetics that matter just as much. Um, for reasons I'm about to explain. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So this was a study I was lucky to be a part of or with many people from around the world, where we actually looked at the germline or inherited genetics of men with advanced prostate cancer in about 500 men. And we made a very unexpected discovery that about 10 to 20% of the men, depending on the, the patient population and whatnot, um, actually have genetic changes in the germline. So the genetic changes they were born with involving a, a few key genes that are the same as the ones that Angelina Jolie was talking about in breast and ovarian cancer. BRCA1, BRCA2, a gene called ATM, a few others. And so we reported this um, a, a few years ago now and, you know, luckily, you know, what was not, I mean, not luckily, it's not the right word, but um, over time, more data has come out to validate what we observed. And if you go to the next slide, um, because of the striking enrichment, it's increasingly part of the clinical guidelines for men with advanced prostate cancer to do genetic counseling and get germline genetic testing for these genes. This is actually a screenshot directly from the NCCN guidelines on the left. And on the right is varying insurance coverages um, for bracket testing in prostate cancer, which is still evolving and changing in real time. But I suspect it's going to change very, very rapidly as a result of what I'm going to the next slide. If you go to the next slide, so hot off the press, um, could not be more hot off the press. Um, this stuff doesn't just matter for um, you know, the risk that you might get cancers or your family might get cancers. It matters for the drugs you might get because both an initial study from 2015, that's one screenshot on the top left, 
um, was actually validated in a phase three clinical trial that was reported out yesterday. So I had to update my slide deck yesterday before, to make sure I got this in, um, which confirmed in a randomized big phase three trial that will be guaranteed part of the FDA approval process, men with advanced prostate cancer who have genetic changes in BRCA1, BRCA2, or ATM, and critically, those changes are more likely going to be in the inherited genome than they are in the tumor genome in the, for these genes, are eligible for a drug called Limparza or Olaparib, which is specifically targeted to men who have that genetic sequence. And it is not useful at all in other men. And this is a pretty large patient population. This is somewhere, depending on the, 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 the cohort, 10 to 20 percent of, of so anywhere from like almost one in five men with with advanced prostate cancer could conceivably have this drug on the table if they have their genetics um, and it is increasingly so we've all anticipated this and it is increasingly the case that one can access these drugs even i, I mean i frankly speaking anecdotally have started to see this in clinical practice of getting off-label approvals for this drug in men who have germline or inherited genetic testing and have one of these events. So this is not an abstract theoretical thing. It is something that has immediate clinical impact. And this is not tumor genetic testing, but rather germline or inherited genetic testing. So uh, I believe that the mutations that we're talking about are also sometimes referred to as DNA repair genes because there's yes. a whole slew of them. Is that correct? Yes. And in fact, in the NCCN guidelines screenshot, um, there, there's a, there's a, oh, you go to the next slide, 20, and there's something called, yeah, homologous recombination is another very, or HRD or HR, um, all of those acronyms are being used, um, to describe this, but DNA right. repair or BRCA or any of those things. Right. And I, I, what you're bringing up is really important. And as you said, it's literally hot off the presses and it's, it's big, um, but, uh, again, you're not here to talk about germline, but if, men do have germline mutations besides knowing that they may qualify for uh, Linparza uh, and it may help them. Uh, are there other things that you would recommend a man consider or do particularly with their family? And, yes. and would you touch on that so, please? Yeah, so first on the treatments, it's not just Limparza or Laparib, but it also is, there are other, there are chemotherapies that we would not typically use in prostate cancer that we'd probably want to use for men in this situation, uh, certain platinum chemotherapies and whatnot. In terms of family, so yeah, I meant I sort of hinted at it earlier. Um, there's something called cascade testing, is the phrase, um, which is that you know because this is in your inherited genome, it's the genes you were born with that you got from your mom and your dad. It, it is also conceivable that um, you may pass these things on to offspring, and or you may have siblings who, unbeknownst to them, are also carriers, and that might put them in a higher risk category. And so this gets very complicated very quickly. And we don't like to do this in an, on an island. And so our practice when available is to actually refer men to a clinical genetics counselor, genetic counselor, and they are, their entire career is focused on helping people navigate these situations in extreme detail with a lot of care and thought. And I would just I strongly encourage people if they're thinking about inherited or germline genetic testing, to figure to see about um, um, genetic counselors as well who can help navigate this. Right, and these mutations in the germline could also affect not only your siblings but the children and the grandchildren of your siblings. Yes. Yeah. Precisely, um, and so that's why it's complicated. And so you know, don't feel like you should navigate this alone. Talk to your doctor and ask them to refer you to a clinical geneticist or genetic counselor uh, because you you should you, you may need some help with that. Um, on this point, so there's a question about PARP inhibitors. That, that's the other class, that's another name for these drugs like Limparza. Will they work? Will some other ones work better than Olaparib? And will, um, the honest answer is, is we don't know because Olaparib is not the only PARP inhibitor in development. It's just the first one sort of through the finish line, so to speak. Um, I, think, I think the answer is, is I don't know. They might work and they might work even after Olaparib stops working. But that, again, that's why we need to do these studies. We don't. We the honest answer is, is we don't know. This is Jan. Um, a quick comment on BRCA1 and BRCA2. Ellie, if you can comment on this 
for me. But um, it's my understanding that in prostate cancer, they are the most common mutations. And of the two, BRCA2 is far more common than um, BRCA1 in prostate cancer. Is that correct? Yes. And what's interesting about that is, is like it's kind of the reverse in breast cancer. Um, but I, scientifically, nobody has any idea why or what that means. Right. I also um, thought it was helpful, your comment about a urologist for, versus a medical oncologist, because patients often don't know the difference between the two doctors, and they're not sure when to see one or the other. So I think that's really helpful. And if I understand you right, this inherited um, germline genetic testing is a time where um, uh, seeing a urologist, they are more familiar with this and um, medical oncologists, maybe both. But I, I want to point out, uh, I wrote an article on this a while back, that one of the main differences is that a urologist is um, trained and board certified in surgery primarily, um, often not board certified in internal medicine, where a medical oncologist is board certified in internal medicine. And I think patients um, deserve to kind of know the difference between the two doctors so they can make their decisions about who they would like to see. And there's a few other differences, but I think that's a, a primary one. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think that's fair. And I think, you know, as, as in, more, in more in advanced prostate cancer, I think having a medical oncologist um, on your team would be, would be very helpful um, yeah. because a lot of the treatment decision making gets very complicated and outside of the scope of what a urologist in the same way that, you know, you would not want the medical oncologist operating on you. Trust me, you would not want me doing that. Um, I have not, I have not picked up a scalpel since medical school. Um, uh, you, you, you would certainly want to have a medical oncologist with you for the more advanced decision making. Um, and they may be able to help sort of navigate both of these tests. And just to be clear, the other thing I'll say, because I think this came up earlier about the tumor genetic testing and like the timing of it. And so to be clear, the germline genetic testing, inherited genetic testing, um, that is your, the genes you were born with, that does not change. Um, so that, that can be done. You, we oftentimes will have that discussion the first time we meet a patient with the newly diagnosed advanced prostate cancer, we will say, you should consider this now because it, you know, it's not going to change um, and it might be useful to guide care down the road. I would also like to add in the conversation about uh, the when you bring a medical oncologist in, if you live in a major metropolitan area and there are options for different oncologists, uh, it's it's in my experience that you're best off finding someone who is an expert in prostate cancer if you're dealing with prostate cancer, if you're dealing with a different cancer, someone who's an expert in that area, because all of these fields are changing quite quickly, and it's hard to keep up with the current and new treatments for each cancer because they are different. So if you live in a rural area, you may not have uh, easy access to a specialist in prostate cancer. Um, and uh, and uh, if you live in a met metropolitan area, there, there probably will be options. Uh, and I would always recommend to somebody find, an, on, find the specialist because they're going to be know a lot more of what the newest things are. I mean, as Dr. Van Allen pointed out, I mean, we got a brand new uh, potential, uh, you know, drug uh, yesterday. And, uh, and if you are in a rural area and you don't have the option to find that specialist as a medical oncologist, try to see if your local oncologist who may be treating all cancers, if they're willing to work with a specialist in, you know, somewhere else and, and work with, use them as, as guidance. And a lot of them are very happy to be able to do that because they know that they have limitations in their knowledge. It's just not reasonable to expect that they know everything about a particular cancer. So something I want everyone to think about. So yeah, I think that those are great points and I agree completely. Um, so the last part of what I wanted to talk about generally is, you know, this to, to, to sort of make, make an appeal to this audience and ask the question, um, uh, um, oh, sorry. Before I get to that, in the, anyone talk about patients that have had their prostate removed? Should I be getting tested if I had my prostate removed? Um, if you've had your prostate removed, um, and yeah, and you're having, if you're having a, if you've shifted into more advanced disease, PSA recurrence or whatnot, I think that's where it becomes relevant for this conversation. 
Um, but I think that speaks more generally to sort of what can you do to help the field move forward? And you heard about some really exciting developments. Um, and I, I should be very honest with you, I was sort of at the front row of a lot of those things over the last 10 years, and it's taken 10 years to sort of bring some of these things to fruition, including the drug, uh, the trial that came off the press yesterday, um, started basically from some discoveries we made, you know, eight to nine years ago. So um, if you go to the next slide, um, um, the, 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 what do we really know? Um, the honest answer is, is that, you know, the genetics we're talking about here is extraordinarily complicated, whether it's the, the primary prostate cancer, early disease, or more advanced disease. Um, what distinguishes those two? Um, why do some become more advanced? How do some become more resistant? This is extraordinarily complicated, and we just frankly do not understand a whole lot about these genetics in spite of everything I just told you. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, and, and that sort of like collides, um, oops, if you go to the next slide, 25, um, right. that collides with um, sort of, you know, this brutal reality, which I sort of was hinting at earlier. Um, you know, this is from a couple of years ago in terms of data, but like, you know, uh, we have a long way to go. Um, men are dying um, at lar in huge numbers, and we're still woefully behind in figuring out how to do this. And we were been, have been wondering how we can harness the power of patients to actually move this field forward um, uh, directly and sort of not wait for sort of the ivory tower academia approaches towards solving this problem. So if you go to the next slide, um, the appeal to that is, is sort of con contextualized by the following, is that in reality, only 5% of cancer patients enroll in clinical trials the vast majority of patients are treated in community settings and never step foot into places like Dana-Farber where I am a, a physician to actually enroll in trials. And mo we've never really had an effective means of studying patients who do not walk into our doors up until very recently. But now, of course, we have technology. There's lots of, there's lots of ways. The, you know, we are having a virtual uh, a seminar right now um, where the 20 people from all over the place um, and, uh, you know, I think it's working. Um, and you know, we can do this now in a way that I think um, could not have been imagined three, four, five, even five years ago. And so with that as a backdrop, the next slide sort of in, would like to introduce you guys to uh, this project we've been driving for the last couple of years now called the Metastatic Prostate Cancer Project or mpcproject.org. Um, this is the home, a screenshot of the homepage where we state you can have a direct impact on the future of men with prostate cancer. And that is true. It is really in your, in your hands, in your power to actually do this. If you go to the next slide, um, um, so what are we trying to do? We're trying to generate a publicly available database of clinical genomic and patient reported data, all de-identified, in metastatic prostate cancer to accelerate discoveries and new treatments. And actually, this is kind of a cool uh, thing that you may recognize that face um, uh, that, that's actually Joel for the Wall Street Journal would describe it as we launched our project with sort of a, a feature, a uh, pretty, cool, pretty cool photo, uh, where we're trying to find patients and partner directly with patients rather than expect patients to come to us, bring their research to your doorstep, to you, um, which has never been more relevant than it is now to actually overcome our gaps of knowledge and, and move this field forward. So what is actually, and what does this project even mean? So if you go to the next slide, what are we actually having people do? People go to mpcproject.org, they click the count me in button. And this first step is, is they basically answer a few questions and we, they, tell, we, they tell us about them. Um, then they click a button. Uh, they give us a consent to go and access their medical record data, um, which we then de-identify, which means we make sure it's anonymized and private. Um, we access, if there is any available tissue left over after clinical testing is done, so we make sure not to sort of get in the way of that, we access that test and we, and we will send a saliva kit um, to get uh, both the tumor genetics, this sounds familiar, and the germline genetics to then do very comprehensive, in essence, whole genome analysis, so more than what typically is done clinically, but again, here for, for research purposes. We organize all these data, and then we make it available to the research community to learn, to try to overcome things and learn as fast as we can. Um, so if you go to the next slide, it's actually a, a screenshot of what these biopsy kits look like. 
So we actually now send both saliva kits. So basically we send you a kit, you spit in the kit and you send it back to us. And we also send liquid biopsy kits. So here we actually send a kit um, that uh, lets you bring this kit to your next PSA draw. And they basically draw a little extra blood and send it to us via FedEx. And we can actually find the tumor genetics in your blood. So we don't even need to do another biopsy in, in many cases. And this is how we are hoping to just radically change our understanding of this disease, get more data than we could have ever dreamed of to actually then ultimately do what I was describing earlier, which is create the longest list of drug targets and options and precision cancer medicine for prostate cancer. So if you go to the next slide, um, we weren't entirely sure this experiment was going to work. Um, this is not a disease that men like to talk about in any way, shape or form. There's no big social, public social media footprint on this. And yet, we're almost at 2,000, or sorry, 1,000 men who have signed up. As you can see, we've hit just about every state. I think we actually have Alaska now, so that's included. We still are missing people from North and South Dakota. Um, if anyone knows anyone who would like to sign up so we can check off all 50 states. Um, but, but critically, we're getting data from men whose voices have not previously been heard. The vast majority of the participants in our project to date are men who are not treated in academic medical centers that where research is traditionally done and otherwise would be lost to, to, we would never be able to learn from them. And we are now learning from them in spades. And we're actually making the data available in real time or as close to real time as we can keep up to and empower the research community. And we're now actually starting to make some insights. Um, we're actually starting to do some analyses that actually think are gonna be really exciting um, uh, for the field and to move it forward. So go to the next slide. Some just additional details. Um, just to be clear on this project, the idea here is that we're paying this forward. This is a research project. So at least for now, uh, we cannot, we're not allowed regular from a regulatory perspective to return individual results back to patients. You are in essence paying this forward to the future, to your brothers and to your sons and to your grandsons um, and to your families to try to help us learn as fast as possible. We do share generalized information with the community in as fast as we can. So it is conceivable. So for instance, like the, the big trial that was announced yesterday that is purely based off of genetics, as we learn these things in aggregate, we wanna share it with the community um, and we make it available to everyone. This is not a territorial silo. We are completely against that. That, that is sort of a very antiquated way of doing this whole science. Um, and ultimately the key thing is, is the more we get, the more data we have, the more patients who say count me in, um, the faster and better our research is gonna be. And so I'd just like to thank the folks who have submitted samples so far, there may even be some on this call. Um, and I would encourage those who are interested to check it out and or to talk about it with their friends and family, their oncologist, whomever, um, and spread the word because ultimately this only will work if patients share with other patients. Um, any questions on that? Um, looks like there's sort of a, all the, it looks like Jan is sort of uh, talking about one specific case. Yeah, but um, in the meantime, uh, Ellie, I, I want to say, and as you've mentioned, I'm actually patient <clears throat> one. Uh, my yes. my friend, late Jack Whalen, was patient zero, so I guess that makes yeah. me patient two. Um, but what I'm really excited about this project, and I encourage everybody on this call uh, to consider uh, joining. Uh, and Dr. Dan Allen has said that uh, made mention in one of those slides that this information is being shared. It's not, there's not going into silos. And for those people who are familiar with research, I know Rick uh, on the call is, what happens a lot of times is that the information is not shared among all institutions. Uh, and sometimes we see where there's a waste of funds and time because it gets replicated uh, or somebody goes off and does something which perhaps wasn't even being helpful because they don't know this has already been shown not to be valuable um, and what makes this such a beautiful project is it's going to be available to any researcher and they've already had i think i'm aware of see the two or three data releases that yep. have gone out to the public and that any of person who participates in the project um, gets uh, updates uh, as there is data released so you can bring it to your doctor now, as, as Dr. Van Allen said, that they're not gonna tell us as the participant, if this speaks to us, they're not gonna tell us what our genetics were. But of course, if we get sequenced, 
Um, and I know that's, uh, you know, this is probably, I know you guys cringe when I say this, uh, but, you know, you can certainly take a look at your sequencing or work with your oncologist and see if perhaps there's something that's been discovered that might make sense for you and have at least another conversation, another question to talk to with your oncologist. So again, I want to really encourage people thinking about participating and they can reach out to Dr. Van Allen, they can, can reach out to Jan or to me and we'll help uh, you navigate to learn more about it and hopefully join me and join us uh, in participating. Yes, so thank, you, thank you, Joel. And I think, you know, I recognize we're past the hour. I'd, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't get to slide 34, um, I, which I included just because, you know, here we are uh, having a virtual meeting. I'd be ashamed not to bring this up. Um, you know, there are emerging guidelines on COVID-19 and prostate cancer. I took a screenshot of one part of the uh, NCCN guidelines that are being written and rewritten in real time. So what I just pasted from yesterday may not be correct today. I think that's how fast this is going. But what we're trying to do is come up with some principles on what treatments are necessary, what treatments can be put off for a little bit, um, and what, you know, think about. Um, there's far too much to cover and I think it's such a moving target it's, it's like impossible to sort of summarize um, but I put this link to this URL um, which is an open guidelines document uh, that has uh, the most up-to-date guidelines for prostate cancer and ultimately you should have this conversation with your doctor. I know all of my patients are, are uh, talking to me uh, in real time about we're, we're, we've sort of had to adjust some patient plans We've moved things around here and there. Uh, I do my my clinics are now in essence exclusively virtual at this point. Um, but you know we're all trying to figure this out together and just don't feel like you're alone. There are guidelines that exist and that are emerging and that you and your doctor can can work on together. So with that, I'll end only a few minutes late. Sorry. Um, uh, here's a, my whole lab. All the people I work with scientifically. I'll give a special shout out as always to Jan and Joel. Um, likewise, all the other patients, patient advocates. Um, and, and really, like, it, it's, it's the only way we're going to solve this problem is by working together um, uh, and, and, and wor working hard on this together is going to be the sort of the key to this. Uh, and so thank you all for, for participating in, in this seminar. And I'm happy to take any questions offline um, or, or some, uh, in some other venue uh, down the road, maybe one day in person. <laughs> Yeah, so if anybody has any questions, uh, if you can send the questions to either Jan or myself, and we will be glad to forward them on. Um, so I think that's probably the best way to deal with that. Um, also, I want to, if anybody is interested and in, didn't write down the link to the NCCN guidelines, we've published them on cancerabcs.org. Um, it's actually, the slide is back up again, but if you go to cancerabcs.org and you go to the COVID papers, um, those guidelines are published right there. Um, so it's the same guidelines. Again, thank Hold you. from thank updates you. available. I'm sorry about that. Um, anyway, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Van Allen, for giving us your time. I know I know it's a strain, and we really appreciate it. Um, and Jan and I will hang on a little bit I, if, in case Dr. Van Allen has to leave, if there are any other questions that we perhaps can ask. But again, um, you can forward uh, by email to jan at cancerabcs.org or joel cancer at cancerabcs.org, and we'll be glad to forward those questions on to the doctor. So thank, uh, thank you both very much. I apologize. I do have to step away, um, but um, as you heard, I'll have to chat offline. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much. So if there's anybody else want to have any questions, you know, you can kind of, you know, share them with us now. We'd be glad to try to respond or and those that we can't, we'll make sure we send it on to the doctor. I'm assuming we've answered everyone's question. Yeah. I, Dan, do you have anything in closing? Gonna, nothing new in the chat box and people are signing off and we will send you a link to this video. So great webinar. Thank you, Dr. Van Allen. Thanks, Joel. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Stay safe. Thank you. Uh, everybody, be careful, okay, and social distance.